So our landscape requirements falls under section, you know what number that is? XXX1V, that is 34, Article 34, Land Development Standards. Um, this is all the way towards the end of the zoning code is one of the last things you're going to go through. And with that zoning code, with, with that section of the code we'll go into right now, there's a lot of little things in here. Um, and this is one of the things that separates the really knowledgeable site planners from the ones that are just kind of muddling their way through this because you have to read your land development standards very carefully. There's a lot of little tricks in here to look at. Uh, and our parking spaces were part of that. So minimum, minimum landscape requirements, okay? The minimum landscape requirements is 20% of a commercial site. Okay, so that means that you have to have a minimum of 20% of your land as landscape and one-fifth of it. And of course, there's going to be some reasons why we're going to exceed that, but that's what they say. Minimum is, is 20, except for commercial... Uh, except for some specific requirements. Uh, in a front yard, 50% of all required landscaping shall be located in the front yard. They don't want you taking your site, paving the front, and throwing all the trees in the back because it's not going to look nice. And Brookhaven's really big about making places look nice. And as a business owner, you'd want it to look nice because that's going to be attractive to people using it. Street trees, you must plant a minimum of a four caliper, that's the diameter of the tree measured about three feet up, uh, must be maintained and planted on all road frontages in an amount equal to 30 feet on center. So every 30 feet along your road frontage, you have to put in a four inch diameter tree. That's expensive, okay? Landscaping gets very expensive in Brookhaven. Um, you must maintain a 15 foot natural landscape area along all street frontage. In business districts, which is different than, that's the, your J6 area, um, they do have tree pits for your street trees, and then the setback areas may not require landscaping uh, because of the surfacing that, that you have there. You know, usually it's sidewalks, so you can't really grass those over. Uh, let's see. And then, again, Main Street business, you have to have at least one street tree per lot and a minimum of two street trees on corners. Supplemental standards. This is something that has to go above and beyond what we will usually see. And that's why you have to read through the full section of a code. It says that the minimum landscape or natural area of 30% must be maintained in connection with commercial centers, regional theaters, or industrial or office use occupying a site of five or more acres. So if your land is five acres in size or more, you're not going to have 20% landscape. It goes up to 30% landscape. If you have a fast food restaurant, they want 35% of it landscaped. And then you must maintain 50 feet of landscaping or natural area on all road frontage in connection with commercial centers, regional theaters, or industrial areas occupying five acres or more. Whereas if you're just a regular site, you only have to maintain 15 feet of landscaping. But if you're a five acre site or more, now you're going up to a 50 foot landscape buffer. Parking areas. All parking areas shall be screened from a view with a hedge berm or other decorative wall or fence in accordance with the town. Now this is one that you can get waived and there's some very good reasons why. Uh, you do not want your parking facilities screened from the general public. It's a safety issue. Uh, the cars are more likely to be broken into and then we also have the safety of the people coming and going from the businesses. If you're leaving at night from an office and you're walking to your car, you want that parking lot to be well lit and you want people to be able to see you so you don't get uh, mugged or attacked on the way uh, to your vehicle. So do not, you know, don't screen your parking lots. That's just a common sense uh, thing. Even though the town says to do it, if you go to them and say, I don't want to screen it because it's unsafe, they will say, yep, you're right, and you have to do it. It would be nice if they would change the code so you don't have to fight them with this, but it's in there. Uh, just, just use common sense with your design. With the parking lot, you do have to landscape it though. And it says that 50 spaces or more must maintain at least 400 square feet of landscape for each 25 spaces in the parking lot. So a 50 space parking lot 
must have an additional 800 square feet of landscaping inside that parking lot. So that's inside the boundaries of the curbs. Large parking areas are subdivided into smaller parking fields of 50 cars or more with landscape strips and grade separations to reduce the visual impact of large expanses of paving. It also prevents people from driving 90 miles an hour through a parking lot to get to a good space. If you put a berm in the way or a hedge, uh, not many people are going to want to drive over that. If you do have landscaping strips between rows of parking, it's got to be 10 feet wide. And then if you're going to incorporate a pedestrian walkway, you're looking at a 20 foot width. So that would be landscaping with a center aisle for walking on. That gets to be a larger landscape buffer. Irrigation systems. All landscaping must have irrigation. So we want to make sure we keep the trees watered, the grass looking nice. That's got to be in there. Buffer zones, very important section. Okay. What they want is they want to make sure that uh, minimum requirements. Uh, all commercial uses, places of worship, mobile, uh, multifamily, planned retirement community, and uh, plan reti planned retirement communities uh, must maintain a minimum buffer area of 25 feet adjacent to any residential use or zone. Natural buffers, which do not contain, as I was talking about before, they give us specific examples. A density equal to one row of evergreen trees, seven feet high, five feet on center, has to be supplemented. So if you have a multifamily house next to residential, the multifamily property must have a single row of evergreens, seven feet high, five foot on center, that are planted to be a concerted buffer. And those will grow taller, bigger, and create a, a really nice screen between the two properties. There's other buffers as well. If you have, and these are always next to a residential use, if you have um, an L1 district, okay, that's light industrial, you need to provide evergreens in accordance with two rows of evergreens, seven feet high, five foot on center. So that's one evergreen every two and a half feet of perimeter. If you have a heavy industrial use, which is things like shipyards, marinas, lumber yards, then they want a buffer area 25 feet, um, sorry, 25 feet away. Um, that buffer area must be a triple row of evergreens, seven feet high, five foot on center. That is five divided by three, Uh, 1.6 feet on center for every for the 25 feet. So you're talking about a lot of trees being planted and a tree that size, five, seven feet tall, five foot diameter, you're looking easily $50 for an evergreen bush that's going to do that. Uh, and then if you plant it, it's usually triple the cost for planting. So you're looking about 150 bucks around the perimeter of, of your property every 1.6 feet. But wait, it gets better. If you're next to a five-acre commercial center, regional theater, um, then your landscaping buffer gets even greater, next to residential. 75 feet of buffer, and they want to see uh, five rows of evergreen trees, five foot on center, seven foot high. So that means for every foot of perimeter next to a residential structure, you have to provide a single uh, evergreen tree. You know, five feet on center, five rows, that's one foot, one per foot. And that's going to be staggered. And what they're looking to do is create a visual and also a, a noise screen as well. Evergreens are an amazing noise screen because they absorb that, that, that sound so it doesn't affect the residential uh, property. All right. Um, if your site is across the street, you have residential across the street for one of these other uses, you still got to put the buffers in. Right, so that's all got to be put in there. Landscaping gets very expensive. Then we have minimum site requirements. Okay, there are minimum site light standards. This goes into the um, Dark Skies Initiative. We talk about that in Green Building. They give you certain standards you have to follow for, uh, for that. Setback requirements. If you have a piece of property that abuts any of the major roads, the expressway, the service roads, uh, Sunrise Highway, um, you have to make sure you have larger setbacks on there. And what the reason they give these bigger setbacks is 
if the roads were to expand and they needed to condemn your property, they're not moving your house. They did that years ago where they, uh, when they widened Sunrise Highway and they widened the expressway, they wound up having to condemn some properties and physically move the homes and move some of the structures. It's much easier if they just condemn bare land and pay you uh, without moving the, the structure. So any new construction has to meet these, these setback requirements. Then we have the, what types of trees you can use. Okay, these are the trees that are permitted to be used. Um, you can hire a landscape architect to uh, help you pick them out, or you could just Google what they look like and say, I like the look of that, I'm gonna use them. Like I think I mentioned earlier, I usually put a lot of red maples in because it's just it's a tree that I think looks very pretty. So I use those on a lot of my site designs. Um, these are the ones that are allowed to be used in the town of Brookhaven. I would be careful to stay away from any of the ones that are fruit bearing trees uh, because they are messy. Actually, they're, those are prohibited. All right, you'll see here. Here are the ones that we cannot use. You can't use. Uh, I'm not going to read through all, they're all here. Any fruit trees are in here. And the reason why they want fruit trees is they are messy and they attract vermin. So that's something you want to be careful with. Um, pin oaks, Russian olives, and poplar. Uh, weeping trees, like weeping willows. These are not allowed to be used in as street trees. Okay, it doesn't mean you can't use them on your property, but these things grow at such a high rate that they create all sorts of problems with uh, power lines, and they're also known to have branches that break off quite a bit, which can become dangerous to pedestrians and also cars that are nearby. Green landscaping. Okay, so the town's getting big into the green, green area. Building orientation. All buildings shall be oriented for rooftop solar energy to provide the best opportunity for PV or passive systems. They're not saying you have to put PV on your house, on your building. What they are saying, though, is you have to rotate the building on the property to take advantage of PV systems. Now, this is something that the town is requiring, but if you give them a little bit of a pushback and say, I don't want my building oriented that way, it doesn't meet the, it doesn't look right on the site, they will fold on that pretty quickly. Okay, so it's not something you have to, you have to follow through with. Um, and I kind of wish they didn't fold on that. I really wish that if they're going to make a law, and they're going to pass that law and they should enforce the law. Otherwise, if it's not going to be enforced, just get it off the books. There's no reason for that. Um, and these are some just good ideas. Minimize shading of southwest and east faces in the heating season to maximize exterior shading of south in the cooling season. All right, so try and uh, you know, plant your trees and rotate your building to help, help with that. Uh, you have soil management. Okay, you have to have an erosion control plan during construction. You need permanent erosion control methods and then plans to minimize soil impact uh, with landscape installations. So all that has to be required and, and put in place. Uh, required parking spaces we did speak about already. Those are our tables. More of our land use standards, land development standards. Uh, exterior lighting standards. Okay, the town does have exterior lighting standards, uh, which is the Dark Skies Initiative. This is something almost all the towns have, have adopted. It's basically the use of shielded fixtures so that light does not trespass onto your neighbor's property. There's a guide at the beginning of this. Uh, um, it's also included in the Blackboard folder. I've downloaded that for you already that goes in detail as to what types of lights are permitted. But basically, when you're doing lighting design, it's very simple. You can simply uh, take your site plan and hand it off to a lighting manufacturing company, and they will pick out the right fixtures for you and help you create uh, your photometric plan. A uh, photometric plan is basically a plan that shows the intensity of light in foot candles around the property based on lighting fixtures that are picked that's going to prove to the town that you're not creating a light trespass. And I'll put an example of that uh, up to look at a little bit later. And that kind of takes care of the development standards. I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry. these are all the definitions for the, uh, the lighting. I think we're almost to the end of development standards. Let's see if there's anything else. Lighting's a big one. A lot of information here on lighting. 
And the reason it's such a large section is this code was written by someone else, another agency called the IDA, the International Dark Skies Association. They wrote up this model code and they handed it off to the towns to adopt into their uh, laws, into their zoning code, and it was very, very comprehensive. Um, so it's a little bit written a little bit more than it needs to be. Uh, yard encroachments, corner lots, waterfront lots, um, non-conforming. Let's just talk about that real quickly. So the idea of a non-conforming lot or a non-conforming use is something that doesn't, it's not as of right. Uh, it doesn't mean you cannot get it approved. It just means you're going to have to get special permits uh, from the town. Uh, many times it may require that you get a, uh, uh, a change of zone to keep that, that in use. But the zoning code was not always present in the town of Brookhaven. Uh, so if you have property that was constructed prior to when the zoning code was in effect or a section of the zoning code was in effect, you may have a legal non-conforming use, which means you were there first, the town doesn't have the right to uh, you know, change the zoning on you without at least having a hearing to, to hear your side of it. Um, there's a lot of cases out there where the town sends you letters and people or send, sends a, home, a property owner a letter and the property owner just ignores it and your zoning can get changed on your property without you, you know, even saying, doing anything to fight it. So if the town does issue you a letter about coming to meetings, I would suggest, suggest you do go to those. Not very often that it happens, but it, it happens enough. Uh, what else? What else? I think that's good for now. So we're going to look at a couple more examples today, and then uh, we'll move into a lot more examples for the next class.